Greetings, my name is Brian, and I want to build a video game. So today we're going to learn about LERP, and we're going to learn about tweens. LERP and tweens are two ways that we can interpolate from one point to another. We can go from zero to one, or any two values actually, and do it in a cool way. And it adds a lot of uh, professionalism. It makes our games look a lot smoother, a lot sharper. And uh, in the case of tweens, it can actually handle some of the animation and, and uh, changes in the background without us, eh, I'll just tell you that when we get to the thing. Let's roll that. Don't we have like an animation so people get a chance to like and subscribe or something? My name is Brian Carey, and I am the Savvy Barbarian. Okay, so LERP and tweens. So this discussion kind of pops up because in the last video, and I should have a link for that up in the uh, corner here, the uh, last video we did transitions in shape keys, like how to get from one shape key to another shape key. And we just kind of popped from one to the other. And so maybe it'd be cool if we actually saw the transition. Maybe we actually saw the morph happen from one uh, to the other because you know maybe it's running a mouth and we're running a mouth open the mouth shouldn't just snap open it should open and close gradually or with some kind of momentum so lerp is one way to do that so i'm combining lerp and tween because these two things share a lot of the same concepts basically we're moving from one value to another value and how are we going to do that so lerp stands for linear interpolation they're, they're going to translate from one value to another value in a straight line. So what does that look like exactly? So here's an example that we'll get from our old friend uh, Wikipedia. And we can see uh, X here. Usually the X axis is our time axis. And then the Y axis here is the change of the value over time. So here's my start point right here. And here's my end point right here. And so you can see this is just going to give us a linear interpolation. It is a straight line. It's just going to move in a straight line from our start point to our end point. I mean, it's just a straight, like straighter than Stalin's trip to hell. We're going to go from a straight line from point A to point B. That's all it is. So how does LERP take form? So when we go into our scripting engine in the go.game engine, we're just going to type the word LERP, which is more fun to say, actually, than anything else about this thing. Um, so it, it takes three values, right? So we've got this starting value, and this is a number. This can be a vector, vector two or a vector three. This can be a color, whatever it is that you want to put there. It's a starting value. And then, raise yourselves. We're going to give it an ending value. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so it probably goes without saying that the starting value and the ending value, you, you've got to give it the same kind of thing. So if the starting value is a float, the ending value needs to be a float. If the starting value is an, as a vector three, your ending value is a vector three. You get it. Right. So the last value that you're going to give it is this weight. So basically this is like how fast am I going to move from my starting value to my ending value. And that's really all that is. So now that you know pretty much everything there is to know about LERP, and that's it. When you want to pull the value out, all you got to do is set it equal to a variable. So you whip a variable in front of that thing, like Bob here, and Bob's your uncle. Or Bob is your lerp value, as the case may be. So let's see what that looks like in code. So here we are in the go.game engine, and we've got a really simple script. Um, I'll go through it real quick, real high level. Uh, I'm not going to run through every little detail because I consider this to be more of an intermediate level uh, video and not so much a beginner entry level. If you want to see those, let me know in comments here down below and I'll make some of those as well. But this one, I, I expect you to already know what the process loop is and some of these things. So this is just a really basic setup. I've got the uh, world spatial node here. I've got a ground plane. I've got a camera, a light, and I've got Jeffrey. So here's what Jeffrey is. Jeffrey is just this scene here, right? He's just a spatial node, and we're looking at this cube. The cube's name is Jeffrey, and his color is indigo. It's still a real color. 
Now we've got a timer in here and this timer is set to two seconds. So what we're going to do when we look at the script, I'm going to click this guy and pop the script open. What we're going to see here is during in the process loop, the timer is going to, when the timer stopped, it's going to, every two seconds it'll stop. And if the cube is at position zero, we're going to set it to two. If the position is two, we're going to set it to zero. So it's just going to ping pong back and forth between these two sections. And then we're going to set the translation equal to whatever that, whatever this target value is. All right, so let's run that and see what it looks like. So Jeffrey is the indigo cube here, and every two seconds he's going to teleport from position zero in the x-axis to position two and back again, just like we expected. So that's pretty straightforward and pretty simple code just to make this all easy to understand. Yeah! That's cool, but what if we wanted Jeffrey not to teleport from zero to two, but what if we wanted him to slide nice and easy between those two locations? Perfect idea. Let's use something like Lerp. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over here into our process loop, and we're going to say Lerp, and we're going to feed it some values. We need a start value, an end value, and we need a... And what was that other thing that we needed? How fast it's going to move. The, the, um, the weight, right? So where are we going to start? Well, we're going to start with wherever we are. So that would be translation.x, right? Because that's where we are in the x-axis. That's what I want to move from. So that's our starting position. And my ending position, where I want to go to. I want to go to the target location. So this is my where I'm going to go to, target, and finally the weight. So how fast am I going to go there? I'm going to hit 0.1. And we'll see how that treats us. So there, Lerp is built. It's pretty much just that easy. I'm going to make this and set it all equal to my variable named Bob, which you should never use because it's not a meaningful variable. Ah! All right, then instead of setting my translation equal to target directly, I'll set my translation.x equal to Bob. And let's give that a run and see what happens. So we got zero and we got two. And you see how nice that floated over? Why is it not moving? Why is that not moving? Why, oh, for the love of Bill, is that not moving? And here is what I think is one of the pitfalls of Lerp. So Lerp has its place, and if it's used correctly, and I'm clearly not going to use this perfectly, but I'm using this as an example. So there's going to be people that are going to leave spots in the comments to say, that's not how you want to use Lerp because, yeah, I know, but I've used Lerp and I trip into this pitfall sometimes, and some of you will as well. So I'm going to show you what's really happening here. In what I've done here, in this section, when I've done, when I've called Lerp, Lerp is moving from this, its current position, to this, its target position, right? And it's doing it this much at a time, this much at a crack, right? So it's going to start, let's say it's starting at zero and it's moving to two. So it's moving, let's say that's 10% of the way to two. And then of what's left, it's moving 10% of the way to two. And of what's left of that, it's moving 10% of what's left closer to two. So it's going to keep moving to two forever. And I don't know if it ever actually gets to two. It just gets ridiculously close without ever actually reaching two. But I think there's a place where it's just close enough. So let's just say, instead of saying X is zero, what if we just said... Um, if x is, let's say, less than or equal to 0 0.01, and what if we said this x is greater than or equal to 1.99, right? So we're just inside the start and end points. And let's give that a run, see what happens. So it slides real nice from 0 to 2, and it slides real nice back again. So Lerp is doing what we want. It's doing a nice smooth slide and it's giving us a linear interpolation between zero and two in this case, and it's working. But see, I had to kind of play with the values with the way that I used Lerp. That trips me a lot of times. One of the things that I might like to do is not have to put Lerp and in, uh, in this, this information here right into my main process variable, or excuse me, into my main process loop. Uh, lots of times we want to break things down into separate functions and it makes things easier for us. So let's see what happens when I do that. 
So let's make a function called slide me. And we're going to receive something called an adjustment. There. And now we've made a function. Now I've got to make it go do something. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take these two lines of code. I'm going to copy them and put them right in there. And then I'm going to comment these guys out. Now, the only thing I'm going to do different is I'm going to change this. Since target is a 2 and in target is being passed, I'm going to pass this uh, instead of... I should call my function slide me, and I'm going to pass it target. Slide me target. So now target is coming in through this aid adjustment variable, so I'm going to replace target with adjustment. So it's basically doing the exact same thing that I did before, but I have moved lerp and the actual call of the translation itself out of the process function, and I've moved it into a function that I've created called slide me. And let's see how that looks. So we run the thing, and we see this. Did you see that? Let's see it again. All right, here we go. Ready? Watch close. And there. Did you see it? It scooched just the tiniest bit. So what just happened there? Why did it not scooch from 0 to 2? So what happened is this function, lerp, when this, I shouldn't, should I say function? When this was being called, this was in the process uh, loop. So this was being called every single time. This, this gets dumped right into your main game loop. But slide me is not. I just called this one time, right? When my timer quit, I called slide me one time, and my value, my variable Bob, got updated with one value one time from Lerp, and it moved this far, and that was it. And that's all it did. And so that's one of the tricks. So I, I can either call this function repeatedly from the process function, or just understand that this isn't going to work the way I want that to. So, to me, that's kind of an issue. Like, I don't want everything in my process loop. That's, it gets ridiculously long. Like, I don't want pages and pages of process loop. I want smartly named functions that make this code easy for me to follow. Because, after all, I'm only a barbarian. This should be fairly easy for me to understand. So, now let's have a peek at tweens, right? I think tweens are better than lerp. Lerp has its place. It's it's real quick. It's real dirty. It works great in certain situations, and I use it in my code in some spots. But if I can work a tween in, I will. And you should probably use tweens as often as you possibly can in your code. Just stick them in everywhere because they make everything move better. They make everything move easier. And as a little side benefit, it's like its own separate little powerhouse for um, moving things around in your game. You don't have to sit there and iterate through every little bit in the process variable. You can just say, run, go, be free, and then you can concentrate on other things in your process loop. So that's basically what this uh, top bit is here. Runs without being in the game loop. Now, yes, I know people are going to say, it is in the game loop. It's just, you don't, do you not understand what a game loop is? Yes, I understand what the game loop is. I, what I mean is that I don't have to have this thing stuck in my process function for it to work. Tweens will actually get to the destination number. Now, there's better ways to use lerp than I did, but that little pitfall of it not actually reaching the two, that's happened to me a lot of times, and it's happened to other people as well. So I wanted to showcase that as an issue. You can use that that way, and it never quite gets to the value that you want. And it really throws off your code because your logic is correct, but it doesn't ever quite do what you want. Also, what we see with tweens is we've got some really interesting interpolations besides linear. There's things like bounces and elastics and different sine curves and, and all kinds of things. So uh, let me just let me show that real quick. So here's a page. Let me show you my uh, show you the website. Go to this. Oh my goodness! Go to this website. Go to the website. It's called easings.net. And it's it's a real short page here. That's that's really all there is. So bookmark, take easings.net, add it to your bookmarks, set it to your homepage. This is really cool. So I go to this all the time when I'm using tweens. I don't have them all memorized by any stretch. I come here. So each one of these guys, if I float over them, they actually give me a little graphic, a little this little teardrop shape on the right shows me an animation of 
how this actually works, right? So if I if I do ease out sign, I can see this is what happens. If I go, say this one here, you can see it starts slowly over time, it moves slowly, and then in the middle it speeds up a lot, and then toward the end it goes slowly again. So watch this little teardrop shape. You can see it actually happening. It starts slow, goes quick in the middle, and slows down again at the end. Neat. Right, and this one, same thing, it's even more extreme though. It goes very slow at the beginning, then very fast in the middle, and slow at the end. And there's things, you know, start slow and then ends quickly. And there's all sorts of, and some of these are spectacular, like this little bounce guy, check that out. Right, watch that again. Ding, ding, ding. I just love that one. I don't know why. Some of these are cool, like this ease in. It actually goes in the negative direction. It actually goes in the wrong direction first, and then bounces back out. Elastic is cool. So you can actually hit something and bounce backwards, bounce forwards. These are really sweet. So you can use these to control your character. Ever want to make your character bounce when he gets to the bottom of a fall? Cast a ray straight down and use a tween to make the guy bounce when he hits the bottom. So with all those neat different interpolations, it makes your, your presentation, it makes your indie game look a whole lot more professional. So how do we use tweens? Well, there's a couple of steps. Step number one, we need to program the tween. And step number two, we need to start the tween. And that's it. Congratulations, you know how to run tweens. Okay, we might want to dive into a wee bit more detail in step number one. So here's how it actually takes the arguments, all right? So you're gonna type your tween. You're, gonna, you're going to address the tween. Hello, tween. And there's a number of different interpolations. There's interpolate methods, there's, there's different ones, but the thing that you're gonna use more than anything else, uh, the most used one is this interpolate property. You're gonna pick a property on your object and you're gonna interpolate it from one value to another value. So that's one we're gonna look at. So you're gonna type almost this verbatim a lot, just how wherever your tween is in your list you'll you'll get to it and you'll say dear tween dot interpolate property okay then we got to give it some stuff the first thing we're going to give it is what on earth am i working on step one you've got to tell the tween what object that you want to mess with second thing that you need to give it what property am i messing with so you've told it what thing you're going to screw with. Now what property on that thing are you going to screw with? After that, it starts to feel a little bit like lerps again, right? So we're going to provide it a start value, and then we're going to provide it an end value. Obviously, these two things need to be the same. They both need to be vector twos. They both need to be vector threes or floats or integers or whatever you're going to give them, colors. But they need to be the same type. The next value you've got to give it is the amount of time you've got to do all your junk in right? Is it one second? Is it a half a second? Is it 40 seconds? I don't know. That's up to you to figure that part out, but you're going to give it some kind of time value, and this is going to be in seconds. The next value is the transition type, and then after that will be the ease type. Now, you remember the web page from easings.net because you've memorized easings.net because I told you easings.net, right? It looks like this. Go to easings.net. Look at these coolnesses. So you're going to pick one of them shapes out and you're going to plunk it in here and we'll show you that in an example in just a second. And then lastly, you can optionally give it a delay in seconds. Now, if you leave this value off, that's fine. It'll just run right, right away. If you put two in there, it'll delay for two seconds and then it'll run. I personally learn best by example, so let's go do that. So here's our wee bit of code again, but this time we're not going to use slide me anymore. Let's make a new function and we're going to add a tween in here. So step one, we're going to pick Jeffrey.spatial, and we're going to hit plus, and we're going to look for tween. Tween uh, stands for absolutely nothing. Like there was no other useful words in the English language they could make up. So, or, or it could just stand for between. I'll bet you that's it. So you double click tween, and now we've got a tween in here. I recommend that you rename this to whatever you're going to call this, but whatever. We'll just leave ours at tween for the time being. I'm going to go back into my script and let's make a function where we fuss with this tween and make it show us something really cool. So this one we're going to call it tween slide and we'll make another adjustment variable that we're going to receive things in. 
And here's us programming the tween. Step one, remember step one, program the tween. Step two, start the tween. So here's step one. First, we're going to pick the tween. Now we are here in this tree, so we can call this directly. We can just say dollar sign, and it's, it knows I'm just going to pick tween from the list, right? There. Now we're going to dot, we're going to pick interpolate. See, there's different interpolation things that it can mess with, but we're going to pick interpolate property. So interpolate property. So step one, object. What is the object that we are screwing with? Well, from the perspective of this script, which is here, we are screwing with this one. We're screwing with our self. So we're just going to type self. Now, if we were messing with, with uh, Jeffrey, we would put Jeffrey in the list here. We would, we could just say dollar sign Jeffrey, and we would be messing with that one, but we're not, we're going to do self. Next thing we're going to do, it wants to know the property. So this is the actual property. So now we're, we're telling it what we've told it, what object we're going to mess with. Now, what property on that object are we screwing with? So, I'm going to click this guy here and I'm going to float over here and I know I'm going to mess with my translation. So what is that? If I float over it, it's called translation. This one isn't going to be that hard to remember. So let me go back over to my script here and I need to put it in quotes because I always forget the quotes and it doesn't work if you don't give it the quotes. Translation. All right. Done. So now we've told it what object we're messing with, and we've told it what property we want to interpolate. Next thing we need to do is give it the starting value. Once the initial value, what is that? Well, in this case, since we're moving this thing along the x direction and the property here takes a vector three, this initial value also needs to be a vector three. So that's what we're going to do. Now I'm going to actually give it its starting location, which is its current translation. So I'll just put translation. And now it wants the final value. So it wants the ending number. What is this? So it's going to be another vector three. And so I'm going to have to invent that real quick. So we'll just say that variable Charlie is equal to translation plus vector three of whatever my adjustment is here. So I'm just going to add this little tweak from target and I'm going to add that onto my current translation. All right? So that's my final value. So my final value is going to be Charlie. Don't use unmeaningful variable names. See how confusing this is. Yeah! Next thing is the duration. How long is it going to take to get from my start value to my end value? I'm going to give it one second. That was easy. Next. Oh, this is where all the craziness starts. This is pretty cool. Now, if you want tween to give you a uh, linear, there's a linear one right, right there. You can actually still make it give you linear interpolation if you want, but why would you do that when you have all these neat things? So let's pick something like, um, let's pick, uh, let's see here. I like that one right there. So this is going to be called ease out bounce. Neat. So let's pick E, let's pick uh, bounce. There it is. And then comma, then we want, we've got all these different combinations. We wanted to ease out. And finally, we can give it a delay, but in this case, I'm not gonna give it one. I just want that to run immediately. There, we've programmed the tween. It's actually easier once you do this a couple times, it's not that bad. We're just telling it once again, what is the object that I need to mess with? What is the property that I need to mess with? And then we're going to give it the starting value, the ending value. It needs to know how long that's going to take. And then we just go back to easings.net and we pick out some neat shapes. Now, step two of getting this thing to work is to start the tween. Watch carefully. Tween dot start. Yep, that's it. Yeah! Now, let's call the new function here that's uh, it's called tween slide and stop calling slide me. So I'm going to call tween slide. 
And since I'm moving this back and forth by just adding this, instead of setting target to 2 and minus 2, I'm going to set it to, or excuse me, 2 and 0, I'm going to set it to 2 and minus 2. And then I don't have these, uh, this weird lerp action, so I'm just going to set this back to, to 0, and I'm going to set this to 2. So if we get to a 2, excuse me, if we're at 0, it's going to make the target go up to 2. If we get a 2, we're going to make the target be a minus 2. And we're just going to call tween slide and hand it whatever the target value is. And then we're going to let the tween take over. It's just going to run. And let's see how that looks. Starting at zero. Bounce. Do you see that? That's pretty cool. Do you know, that'd be pretty hard to code if you had to do that by hand to get the little, to get every little thing in there. That's not bad. And you're not really limited to just one thing either. For example, let's say we wanted that to, I don't know, spin at uh, at the end. We can actually interpolate another property and stick that in the same tween. We don't need to get like multiple tweens going. We can just have that thing go do whatever we want it to do when it starts, right? So I, I could even set this tween to pick a different object. I'm going to pick the same object, but I'm going to pick a different property. But we could pick multiple objects and still have the same tween run it so that when we say tween start it can go and deal with multiple objects for us. So let me just grab another one real quick. We'll do a second example. So we'll do tween and we're gonna do interpolate property. And we're gonna say, we're gonna mess with our self again. And this time, instead of translation, we're gonna mess with, let's say rotation. Rotation underscore degrees. Yeah, rotation underscore degrees. Don't forget to put the quotes in. Now, we're going to start, since rotation degrees is also a vector with x, y, and z, we need to give that a vector 3. So I'm going to give that vector 3 dot 0. That'll be my start. My final value is going to be vector 3. And let's just let it spin around the y direction, say, 90 degrees. The time that's going to take, let's say that's going to take half a second. And then we get to pick one of these fancy shapes here. So let's go back to easings.net and I'm gonna pick, oh, I don't know. Let's try ease in out sign. Ease in out sign. And um, let's do the delay this time. Let's make it wait 0.5 seconds before it starts to spin. And let's light that up and see what happens. So. The next value, the next uh, line in the code is to start, and here we go. The bounce and the spin, and see how it's combining them perfectly? Not bad. Like you can see, the potential for what this can do in your game is just off the charts. It's going to make your game look so much cooler. Now, let's jump over to Blender real quick, and I'm going to show you how to apply this which was kind of the genesis for this video, is how, do I, how would I apply this to, say, a shape key? First of all, I must move out of the way. Here's our starter cube that everyone deletes. Stop deleting Jeffrey. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to add the monkey head. And this is a neat little trick. Real quick, uh, quick and dirty shape key. This is kind of a neat trick. If you haven't seen it before, this is neat for morphing one object into another object. So we've got this... We've got our monkey inside this cube here. What we're going to do, if you want to see um, more about shape keys, I will post a uh, link in the magical cards down here. And if I think about it, I'll actually put a link to it down in the comments below. We're going to create a shape key real quick. We're going to click add and we're going to add basis. So there's the basis for our shape key is this, this uh, lovely Suzanne. And what we're going to do is we're going to go up to our modifiers and we are going to add this thing called a shrink wrap. So here's shrink wrap. What we're going to do is we're going to apply the cube to be its target. And then we just take Suzanne and scale it way up. There we go. That looks pretty good. And then since we can't actually apply this, what we're going to do is we're going to click this button here, apply as shape key. So give that a click. You see this got huge. I'm just going to scale that back down to, I'm just going to hit Alt S to clear the scaling, right? And then if I look at my shape keys, I now have a shape key over here called shrink wrap. 
So that's pretty cool. Let's look at that. If I click on it and change the value, you can see I've changed into a cube. Now, it's a little small, so I'm going to go into edit mode, and I'm going to scale it up. Move that back kind of roughly into position there. And I'm going to take the original cube and get that out of the way. So now I've got this lovely cube, and when I go to shrink wrap and turn the value up and down, monkey, cube, monkey. This is kind of freaking me out, actually. So now I've got this monkey, I've got monkey cube, and monkey cube is able to switch between a monkey and a cube via this shape key. And we're going to switch from the monkey to the cube and back via tweens. First step, we need to export it. We've got the object selected. We're going to do File, Export, and we're going to use GLTF2. If you want to see a video that explains all kind of stuff about this GLTF2 export, I should have a link for that up here and a link for that also down in the comments. So, GLTF2, we hit the N key to make sure that this is turned on. We would normally switch to embedded. I'm not going to bother since I don't have a material uh, attached to this thing. We're going to include only the selected object. We are not going to have the modifiers applied because it ruins our shape key every time. And our animation is going to include shape keys. So I just need to tell it where to go. So here we are back in Godot again. So first thing we're going to do is open up our monkey cube. Open anyways. And step one is to save this, save the scene as something in the Godot's native format, this TSCN format. So here's Suzanne, fresh in from Blender. And we can see that if we click on the Suzanne mesh, we can come over here to this blend shapes, and we have a thing called shrink wrap. And we can go between zero and one, and we can see Suzanne is morphing back and forth between a monkey head and a cube. And again, if you want to see more about this, there is a link up here in the cards, if I remember to do that, and then uh, we'll put a link down there in the comments as well. So there's more detail there if you want to see how that works. So we can move this, and in the last video, basically what we did was we ended up, um, we just instantaneously changed our value from 0 to 1, and it poofed from one thing to another. But this time, we're going to make it slowly change over time. We're going to morph this value from the monkey head into the cube, and we're going to do it using a tween, which is a way cooler way to do it. We're going to let the tween run off to the side, and it's going to take care of all of this for us. And we'll do it with a neat, like an elastic bounce. What we're going to do is we're going to stick the monkey head into the world scene. And now we'll add a little bit of code and a new script so that when I hit the space bar or hit the escape key, that we're going to morph uh, Suzanne from one form to another one. There, so now I hit the space bar. We're going to morph the monkey is uh, morph monkey we're going to call and send a true and if we're going to hit the uh, escape key we're going to call morph monkey and send it a false so now all we need to do is program the tween appropriately now this time when we do the interpolate property we're not going to interpolate ourselves. the object that we're going to be working on from the perspective of the script, which is here, we're on we're on the monkey cube spatial object, but the property that we need to modify is on the mesh, so it's on Suzanne. So that's the one we're going to work with. So dollar sign Suzanne. Then we need to find out what is the property that we're going to actually change. So if we click Suzanne, we look at these blend shapes. The one that we want, because there may be more than one here, the one that we want is called blend underscore shapes slash shrink wrap. Add the quotes. Okay, so we've told it what object, we've told it what property we're gonna change. Now we need the initial value. So this is if it's true. So we've started with a zero and we're going to iterate to a one. And we're going to take one second to do it. 
and we're going to use let's flip over here to our easings.net and see what we like so I like um, I like ease out elastic for this one so head back to GoDot and let's look at elastic ease out and that should do it now we just have to say tween start and we can do the exact same thing as before if we hit the cancel button but in this case I'm gonna switch the zero and the one because we're going in the opposite direction and that should do the trick let's give that a run and see what happens okay so the other tween on the cube is still doing its job and that's running on the timer so here's us hitting the space bar we hit the space bar and it turns into a cube we hit escape and it bounces back into a monkey see how there's a little bounce at the end of the animation flawless victory so we've looked at Lerp, and that's got some neat things to it. It's quick, it's easy, and it does what we want most of the time. But tweens are a lot more powerful, and we get to use all the neat functions and variations to go from one value to another based on what we have there in easings.net that helps us visualize that. Go to easings.net, add that to your bookmarks, for reals, and use tweens. I suggest you put these in everywhere you possibly can. One thing I didn't really bring out when I was uh, looking at the code is you notice when we use the tween, we called the tween function just one time and it still ran from beginning to end. When we used the lerp, remember how it just ran just a little bit and it quit? But with tweens, it ran the whole time. It ran the entire animation from beginning to end. So that's another neat thing that you can do with tweens is you can just say, you know, um, you know, if you've got some, some tween set up and it animates your mouth motions or something because your character is talking, you can just call it and it'll go and run and you don't have to worry about iterating through the entire blend shape on your own manually for whatever it's going to be. Use tweens wherever you can. It's going to make your game look a lot more polished and a whole lot more professional. Well, I hope you all learned a lot from that. If you have any other comments or questions about how tween works, feel free to leave uh, questions down in the comments, and I'll watch those for a little while, try and get back to you and help out if I can. If you have any suggestions for other videos that you'd like to see, leave those there as well. The next video is probably going to be about how to use shape keys and armatures in your video game at the same time. Now, if you guys could do me a big favor, do me a solid, and click the like and subscribe buttons down at the bottom, I would really appreciate it. I'm a, I'm a very small channel at this point, and um, your, your thumbs up, your subscription, that sort of thing, really helps the channel out tremendously, and I thank you in advance for that. If you want to learn more, I should have a new uh, video suggestion popping up up here, another one right down over there. So give those a click if you like, and I will see you next time. This is Brian Carey reminding you to be a scholar and a barbarian.